Hello, and welcome to the Business of Authority. I'm Jonathan Stark. And I'm Michelle Moulton. And today we're going to talk about the 100 Day Sprint. I love doing this every year. I can't believe we actually haven't recorded this before since we both do this in our emails every year. Yeah. Did you check for we haven't? I'm surprised. Well, I did a search and, and I didn't come up with anything. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I actually have a I have a annual sort of reminder in my calendar, my to do's to, uh, you know, announce the 100 day sprint. What is the 100 day sprint, you ask? <laughs> <laughs> so this is a term coined by friend of the show, Blair Enns on the Win Without Pitching blog. And, and it's funny because when I first read this, I was like, oh yeah, this is true. I've noticed this where, mm -hmm. where everything kind of, business kind of slows down over the summer. And then right around Labor Day, it's like everybody's back from vacation and all the kids are back in school and the weather, you know, in, in uh, at least where we are changes and all of a sudden it's brisk and it's like, okay, let's get some work done. You feeling like <laughs> you haven't really made any much progress over the summer and, and, and it's like the holidays aren't that far away. Yeah. Especially on the East Coast and the Midwest, you just like feel like, oh my goodness, Christmas is coming. Thanksgiving's mm -hmm. coming. What do we do? Yep. Yeah. So this is, and in, at least in software development, I, it was noticeable that, that closing deals for big-ish software products would noticeably increase in the fall and then the drop off over the holidays and they'd pick back up when things started to thaw out maybe in February, March, and then, you know, it just dies down in the summer. It was, it was predictable. It was very predictable. And anyway, so, so with that said, um, Blair has a couple of blog posts that are related to, you know, what can you do during that period to kind of take advantage of the fact that people's wallets are out, so to speak, and people want to get things done. They want to get it done at least in motion before the holidays. So if you, you know, so now's the time to kind of shake the tree. I like that metaphor. <laughs> right. Yeah, the fruit <laughs> is there, ladies and gentlemen, shake it. The first one, I think the first thing that we could talk about today is the magic email. Yes. Yeah. Love the magic email. Yes. And he also calls it the closing the loop email, which is the subject line that he uses. And if, if you, the, the long and the short of it is pretty straightforward. The, if you have deals that have kind of not closed over the summer, you know, the client maybe ghosted you or they're really slow to get back to you. It seemed like there might've been something there in, in May or June. And then they're kind of like dropped off the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. Now's the time to go through your list of kind of, what would you call those deals? These kind of zombie deals. And send the magic email to either get a no, which is great because then you can, you know, stop wasting time and energy on wondering or whatever else you might be doing, uh, or get a yes, or, um, you know, hopefully you'll get a, you'll get something like, like, oh no, we're still interested in this. Let me just talk to my partner and we'll get right back to you. And, mm -hmm. and the reason that it's called the magic email is because it is like magic like you will get a reply and so you're either going to get a no or or some version of a yes or a like no no no, let's keep talking um but you almost never get what you would usually get with some kind of outreach which is like no reply yeah ghosting and, yeah and a, a, a friend of mine from way back kai davis i think it was kai set up actually he, he had so much success with this that he set up a website called magicemail.com or themagicemail.com and it has a, a version of this it's not exactly the same but it's it's uh and there are all these testimonials on it of people like oh my god this is magic i i've been waiting for three months to hear back from this client i sent the magic email and five minutes later they replied it really works oh the the record with my client base is one hundred and thirty-seven thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. So this person sent it out, and it was it was a client where they'd said that they were going to do the work, and they were getting close to the end of the year, and they didn't. So they're like, "Oh yeah, 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 we're sorry." And even better than that, in some ways, because it wasn't a client he was going to renew the next year, is um, he um, he got the one hundred and thirty-seven thousand, but only did maybe half 
of the work of the 137,000. So, uh, you know, you just never know what's going to happen yeah. with these. So the thing about, I mean, obviously we'll link to it in the show notes. You can check it out yourself. But the, the really noteworthy thing about the email is how blunt, for lack of a better term, it's just super to the point. There's no sort of uh, niceties, hope you had a great summer, kind of. It's, it's stripped of all mm, desperation or anything that is remotely like neediness. That's... That's the point. The whole point is to be yeah. like, be like, oh, well, let me just, it's right in front of me. Let me just read it. The subject is closing the loop. Hi, first name. I haven't heard back from you on project slash opportunity. So I'm going to assume you've gone in a different direction or your priorities have changed. Let me know if we can be of assistance in the future regards your name. And that's it. There's a bunch of characteristics to this that are, that are what make it so effective. My favorite one is kind of like, you're just triggering their FOMO so bad. <laughs> you're just like look this is not that important if it gives the impression of like this wasn't that important to me i'm going to close the books on this see you later bye you know where to find me you know yeah. it's kind of like that playing hard to get kind of exactly kind of feel to it well and that's the emotional aspect of it for yourself too is that when you it, it bugs you when you have these things hanging around they're like these ghostly things, you know, that are just sort of floating around. And you, you might even be like counting them in, in your, um, your CRM going, oh, is it coming? And you're, and you're wondering about planning your time. You're wondering about how the revenue is going to flow, all those things. Yeah. And the second you do this, it's like, okay, hands off. It's out of my hands. They will either say yes or no. And I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. it, that sense of closure is priceless yeah it's great but you know what's even better than that is when they say no wait we were just yeah, busy exactly let me get exactly. right back to you yeah here's one hundred thirty-seven thousand dollars of my money <laughs> <laughs> right right yeah so you know you can use this anytime it's not this is not yeah. specifically a 100 day sprint type of thing but it's a great time to do it uh, because people you know reasons already stated uh so that's a great i think it's a great tip it's almost like to what does he say in the he said uh he said draft it modify it if you dare but send it to all those prospects you were talking to over the summer um yeah i wouldn't modify i mean it's just other than you know putting your name in there the temptation is to get all polite and nicey nice and and that will ruin the effect because it makes yeah. you seem like you know needy it's well yeah i mean i i changed the last sentence just because i would never say if I can be of assistance, that's just not a phrase I would ever use. But, you know, mm -hmm. let me know if I can help you in the future. Same difference. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. Then, and then I think in Kai's magic email, it doesn't even have that. It's, but the nice thing about it is having a line like that is that it's, it's very, it's the indication that it's no hard feelings. So yes. it's like, it's like, hey, if you want, you know, if this, if something crops back up, you know where to find me kind of thing. It's not like, ugh. Forget you. You've been, you know, yes. whatever, leading me on yeah. or something. Yeah. And you don't want any of that ever in your emails. This is, you know, it's a very professional email. And especially if your audience is big corporates, yeah. you always, well, I think you always want to keep it professional anyway, but especially with them, just keep it professional. You just never know when what's going on in the lives of the people that you know you're sending these emails to and you never know what's going to happen in the future so you, know, you don't have to burn bridges i always that is exactly what i think you do not know what's going on with them you don't they could or it could it could be something really bad could be going on with yeah. them yeah yeah so i always think that whenever i mean this hasn't happened to me in years but sometimes i get students who who get really sour grapesy about you know, because they invested too much in the sale. So they're emotionally, in, you know, involved with it. And they feel like they, they've expended a lot of emotional labor. And then the client goes with someone else and they get, and they're like, they cheaped out. They're going to regret it. What should I, <laughs> what should I reply? Good luck with that. You know, they, they, it's, the temptation is really strong. Yeah. It's just no, it's not beneficial in any way yeah. to do that. If it's you wasted. want to. Yeah, in a situation like where they get back to you and they say, thanks, we decided to go with somebody else. Um, we just, you know, didn't get around to emailing you. Sorry about that. So it's, it's like no sour grapes. Even if you think like, oh, they're going to regret that. 
you know, they got someone from Fiverr, come on. Or you know the people they show whatever. So like if you're yeah. pretty sure they're gonna regret it and they're still gonna be stuck or they went with like a huge like Deloitte or something, just put a tickler in your calendar or in your to-dos like that in three months you're gonna reach back out and check in. It, and it could you might not even mention the deal, the project. You, it could be for some other reason. Just be like, hey, I saw this in the new, you know, Google I.O. Mm -hmm. announced this new thing that I think might be relevant for companies like you. So I'm reaching out to my network to alert them and you might get you know the conversation might start back up and say like oh hey how's it going with that project mm, that's so good. <laughs> the fiverr guy sucked <laughs> yeah exactly so yes yes always keep it professional you'll probably i can almost say definitely regret it if you don't well and it's also can be a chance to get feedback on sale and you know again it depends if if it's kind of obvious to you what happened. But if it's not, you might say, oh, well, congratulations. I'm, I'm glad you've found a solution to this. Um, would you be willing to share with me what, what were the key decision factors, well, the key decision points that you used to make this or something like that? But you have to do it so it doesn't sound like you're putting the knife in. You know, <laughs> it's got to be really, yeah. really, in fact, to have somebody else look at it before you hit send. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a delicate one. But I like, the way, I like the way you just said it, though. I, I think that was really reasonable. Well, and, and here's, the, here's the thing is that we all have these like peaks and valleys with the work that we do. And I've worked with clients where they're in a stage where it's like, really, I can't get a yes from anybody? Like, what am I doing wrong? And sometimes it's not, you're not doing anything wrong. It can be something that's happening. It can be a string of things, or it could be that you're doing something wrong. And it's helpful to get feedback. And, and then you have to evaluate the feedback that you get of course but it's i'd rather have some feedback than no feedback right yeah and, and in that situation i guess this is kind of obvious because of the way we started the show but if you were slow during the summer it probably wasn't just you i mean it's probably not because of you it probably just mm -hmm. slow in the summer <laughs> and you really you noticed it this year but yeah so i wouldn't beat myself up too bad about it well, it's, it's just sort of as a sidebar comment, it's really helpful when you start to, after you've been in business for a few years, the first year, second year, it's kind of hard to make sense of any of it. But after that, start to see if there is a seasonal component. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, summer can be slow. Um, you know, when I did a certain kind of work in a big firm, summer was really busy. Mm -hmm. for me like it was huge but january was dead so you know there there may be some seasonality to your business and if there is you know you can plan for it and not get you know upset about it or not have enough money in the bank because you know you just assume that whatever high water mark you're at now will continue forever mm -hmm. yeah that's super true like i i have a couple of different clients that have a a shifted it's still that same sort of like two peaks a year but they're offset by like three months mm. uh, i think one of them's in uh or there's three i can think of one was targeting asphalt companies who were really busy in the summer uh, mm. another one was is uh, our mutual friend who helps cpas and they're super busy at the the two oh, big tax tax time, yeah. tax time and, yeah. you know for for uh, personal and corporate and so there it's just offset and what's the other the other ones are education you know, uh, you know, for obvious reasons. Oh, summer's off, yeah. So, uh, well, getting ready for the new school year. So they, they'll like, they can have a busy summer with IT projects and that sort of thing to get ready for the uh, oh, incoming. Oh, okay, year. got it. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, so, it's, right. So the seasonality, so your 100-day sprint might be at a different time of year, but it certainly has, it's very common for a lot of spaces for this to be it. Uh, cool. So that was, so, so, the magic email or closing the closing the loop email is about bringing back zombie deals from the dead and at least getting a yes or no answer. <laughs> like, uh, are we just going to keep dancing? Are you ever going to take me home kind of thing? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Now I've got the dancing with zombies image in my head. I can't get, I can't get it out of there. <laughs> uh, title dancing with zombies. <laughs> really? Um, and then, but so what else can you do this time of year? Uh, the other thing that that Blair recommends, which makes sense, is to uh, do outreach. So maybe you didn't have any deals. Maybe you don't have any zombie deals from the summer or the 
you know, earlier part of the year. Uh, what can you do to change that if you want to take advantage of this this period of time where probably whatever industry you're targeting is going to be getting into busy mode and setting budgets and spending money. Mm -hmm. And he has a thing called the, I think it's the armor piercing introduction. And he frames it exactly how I would frame it, where this, it, it's very delicate thing to do outreach, but maintain control in any ensuing pricing or sales negotiations because it's kind of like you need to do it in a way that's not that's just not needy that doesn't have the stench of desperation yes and what that looks like is a, a hyper hyper focus on a small set of extremely high value uh, potential clients n the opposite of spammy uh, but in but being very specific about sort of like your value proposition credibility indicators like like you're answering the what's in it for me really hard for the person who's receiving the email and uh he's you know he's got a template that that you could use i think it's a really good one similar to the magic email it's very short i don't think i've seen this one do you have it in front of you yeah he think i think he does this over the phone to be honest but i know of, i don't know if this is the article but i've seen him send talk about sending this out i think it's maybe i'm on the wrong one hold on yeah, so that the the one I was thinking of is prospect email. The armor piercing introdu introduction is if you can do cold calls, which I think uh, I've never done, but I know people who have done it very successfully. So that's what that is. But the uh, all right here here it is. Here's the format. You know, hi first name. And this from Blair obviously, so it's customized for him. I'm a business development advisor to creative firms worldwide. I've helped hundreds of advertising agencies on five continents win more business at higher margins while breaking from the convention of giving their thinking away for free in a pitch. And then it has a customized line where it's like, I see you're a member of network or something specific about them that, that makes it obvious that this can't be a mass spam email. And mm -hmm. then asks for the no, the, the closing line is, feel free to say no if you don't see a fit, but might I be of help to you? And so there's a, a lot going on in this little, little message, but he starts off with like a very you know, focused, here's what I am, here's who should I help, right? some credibility, about you know obviously this is <laughs> assuming this is true because it'd be a whopper of a lie if it wasn't uh helped hundreds of advertising agencies on five more content you know blah 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 blah. i won't reread it but it says to the reader immediately immediately what's in it what here this here's this guy blair what can he do for me and he says right like right there like if you want to win mm -hmm. more business without giving your thinking away for free in a pitch and assuming that piece of your email, dear listener, if that piece of your email is on the person's mind, they're going to be very interested. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, he asked, and then there's a customized section to just be one sentence that is, makes it obvious that you've done your homework, you know something about them, you have researched them, and this is a high, and you have reason to believe this is a really relevant message to send. Uh, and then he asked for the no, which is so important. Because what you really want is an answer, even if it's no. You don't want right. You don't want no reply. <laughs> oh, that's the worst. It's the worst. So yeah. So you ask for the no. It takes away the emotional weight of it. So they don't have to. You know, they don't have even a twinge of feeling bad, and they can just be like, "Oh, no, thanks." You know, we're we're all set. And what's what's the ask in here? Is it a, a call? Uh, no, there's no ask. It's. I mean, it's implied that it's a reply, and depending on how I I do this a little bit differently depending on who I'm reaching out to. So my, my ask for the no is usually when I'm, it's some kind of podcast outreach, either I wanna go on someone else's show or I wanna get a guest for one of our shows. And I usually say like, it's totally fine to say no, dot, 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 uh, but would you join Rochelle and I for 45 minute audio interview, question mark. So they can answer yes or no. It's not like an open-ended question, like, you know, what do you think about coming on? The it's, it's like <laughs> now they have to compose something. Yes. Uh, just reply with a yes or a thumbs up and we'll send over more details. So you make the call to action super, super easy. So they don't need to archive this, maybe get around to it later. They can just hit reply, yes or no, and get it off their plate. So and it's sort of a low ask. It's, a low, it's like a low pressure kind of engagement. I'm not asking for money or anything. But I think that asking for a no, anytime you do any kind of outreach, 
Asking for a no is huge because that will, I think, dramatically increase the odds of getting a reply, which you really want. And giving them one single closed-ended question to respond to in the email is, I think, also way more likely to get your response. So like, don't ask three questions. Don't ask any open-ended questions. It's like, what is this email for? This email is, is I want to get a yes from this person. That's what I want. And my second favorite thing to get is a no. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, and a, a rule of thumb is the busier or more, you know, famous in quotes, the person, the shorter the email, the shorter the request. Yeah. Because that's really what this is about is getting an answer, getting a response. And obviously, yes is preferred, mm -hmm. but you just want to increase your chances of getting on their radars, radar so that you know that you've seen it. And then if that pitch didn't work, maybe you wait six months or a year and you try a different pitch. Yeah, totally. Yeah. But the, there's, there's key factors here. Probably the biggest one is keep it short. <laughs> that's, yeah. what, that's what you're saying. I mean, like, yeah. get to the point. Don't waste my time. Explain what's in it for me, the reader. And, you know, and, and just have a single yes or no question that they can just hit reply and boom, yes, no. The other thing I liked about that email is that first paragraph, it was a long sentence. I mean, we're so used to short, choppy sentences these days, mm -hmm. but it was packed with goodies mm -hmm. and it was a sentence. Like it wasn't like three paragraphs about how wonderful you are. It's one <laughs> and it's highly focused on your target. And it's impressive. And yeah. I guarantee there is something impressive about everybody listening to this. You just have to find the right combination of words for that first paragraph. Yes. What makes you meaningfully different from your competitors? Or what is the thing that your buyer is wrestling with or up nights dealing with? And that's the, yeah, I almost said trick. And I hate to put it like that, but immediately answering the, the, what is, what is it? Whiff them is what you said the last whiff time. Yeah. What's yeah. in it for me? Whiff them. Yeah. And they're either going to be like, oh, I don't care about that right now. Or, oh, wow, this perfect timing. Let's jump yeah. on a call. Yeah. And it's, it is, I, I like the, um, the feel free to say no thing. I mean, just as an example, I get a lot of things in LinkedIn and somebody will connect with me and I'm looking at it going, yeah, they're probably going to want to pitch me on something. And we connect and they immediately pitch me. And I will say no. Like I will just say, it doesn't matter how, if it's like five paragraphs of stuff or one thing, I'll say, I'll usually say, thank you, no. I want to set it clear right up front that no, I'm not a target for this. Or I might say, yes, let's talk. I mean, that could happen. But usually this is more bordering on spam without actually being spam. Mm -hmm. And so there's something freeing about getting that no and being able oh, to yeah. move on to the next thing. Absolutely. Yeah. It's funny. I, I notice when someone sends me a really good one of these, like I, yes. I save them when mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, wow, this one got me. How did they get me? <laughs> to, you know, because I am like ruthless with like delete, 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 delete. And every once in a while, there'll just be that subject line that it's perfectly timed. I'm trying to think of an example, like, like, somebody like me it could be something like uh it's like something that would be on my mind so i remember there was a phase where i was like how am i gonna you know i'm like basically completely off of social media other than auto, you know syndicating stuff through automation uh, you know like what but I'm, I'm like i feel like i should be bringing the message to more people over social media i feel there's like this tension in my mind it's like i don't want to do it and it's not worth that much to me but it's anyway so like yeah. when when i'm in that zone and I get an email like, you know, put your social media marketing on autopilot. I am going to open that. Not because mm -hmm. it, even as spammy as that is, it's on my mind. And so I'm like, all right, I'll at least read this. Maybe something, there's something new under the sun in this area or something. And I, I, I will, they'll get me, right? And then I'll, and then I'll open yeah. it up and at least open it. And then when I get in there, it'll be like, it still could lose me. You know, it's like, if it's really yeah. long, I'm like, I'm not going to read this whole thing. Or, oh, the other thing that really kills me is like, here's links to all of this stuff. It's like, I'm not going to, I don't want a homework assignment. <laughs> Just get to the point. What is in it for me? And like, it'd be even more amazing if they have like a productized service or something and be like, hey, for this much money, we can get you this many views guaranteed. I'd be like, 
Yeah, I can yeah, actually make the money. decision right then. Yeah, but you know, ninety nine percent of the time, that you know, when you get an email like that, it's either it's about something I just don't. You know, HR troubles keeping up nights. No, <laughs> just totally oh, irrelevant spam. I keep getting something for agricultural waste. I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> no. <laughs> not a problem. Yeah. I'm quite sure that our listeners are not spamming their people. In fact, it's probably the opposite. I would guess most of our listeners are so worried about coming across as being spammy um, that they're sending out fewer of these things than they actually could. If any. Right. Yeah. So here's, there's a couple of tricky things here. The, the, let's loop back to the desperation thing because it's like if you were so successful, why are you sending out emails like this? I think the, there's a couple of things happening here that you can use to avoid that. So let's call them out. So the first one is the fact that you're asking for the no and that you're leading with like, hey, I've got something valuable I do for people like you. Does it seem like something you're interested in currently? That kind of a feel to it. It's like, if, it's fine if you're not. I just wanted to let you know that it was available. The other thing is, if when you're doing direct outreach, if you're going, if the kind of business that you have is going to turn into a sales interview and you're going to try and do the why conversation and try and talk them out of working with you, as I put it, then it, it always feels weird to people when they're learning about outreach. They're like, well, how can I, how can I ask those questions? Because then the prospect is just going to be like, well, you called me. Like, why are you... <laughs> <laughs> Why aren't you pitching me? Like, I, right? It seems like the thing right. that would happen after that is for a pitch. It's like, hey, could I pitch you on my SEO services or could I pitch you on my executive coaching process or whatever? So it's important in the outreach to them, whether it's email or LinkedIn or whatever, to be like, it's like, it's all about finding out if it's a good fit. Like, hey, you know, I, I know some things about your business. I think you might, I think we might be a good fit. There could be something there would be worth talking about. Uh, if not, that's cool. That's fine. And present the ask. So, so like present the next step as a conversation to see if there's a kind of mutually beneficial engagement uh, on the table. And if not, and, and what that does is when you get on the phone, it's framed such that it's more exploratory in both directions. It's not like, hey, let me tell you how great my stuff is mm -hmm. and why you should buy yeah. it right now. Yeah. So that's really, I get that question all the time. Whenever I talk about outreach, they're like, well, how am I supposed to have a why conversation after I beg them for a phone call? And I'm like, no, it's about seeing if there's a good fit between the two companies for a sort of mutually beneficial outcome. Well, and there are so many people who are used to the, the hard sell pitch that they've created armor to yes. ward against it. And so their first reaction especially if they're in any any function that looks like purchasing their first reaction is no no no, no i don't want that i don't want that no 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 i don't want to talk about, i don't want to talk about that so yeah and and i think that some of that reaction comes back to us as the service providers so it's it's really it's not only relaxing it's enjoyable not just to us but to the prospect when you let all that go just have these kind of conversations. And the ones who are inundated, like I'm thinking people who run a function inside of Fortune 500 companies, mm -hmm. any function, you know, pick a function. Those are the ones who get hit on all the time with this kind of stuff. It's like a beautiful woman in a bar, right? Everybody wants just everybody wants to talk to her. So yeah. And so the one who is going to be relaxed and confident and say, hey, you know, this this might be a, a match. Let's talk a little bit. Or, you know, it definitely isn't. And you walk away. Right. Yeah. It's not about winning at all costs. Right. So there's another point here. You use the word armor, which is perfect because uh, Blair recommends, as do I, and I think you too, to lead with the pointiest point of the spear. So lead with the highest specificity thing that you do that you think is relevant to the, the person you're reaching out to so that you know you might offer a bunch of different things you know you might be a little generalist still in your your uh, offerings your product ladder your services but when you're doing this outreach you know you want to pierce through all of that kind of like oh we can do anything for anyone vibe yeah and make it in, in order for you to have the email be very short or the communication very short you need to be very specific so yes. lead with something that's so specific that they're not going to think, oh, I know 
10 other companies that do the same thing. You know, so if you come in and you're yeah. like, oh, we do, I don't know, SEO and conversion rate optimization and email marketing and blah, 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 blah. It's, yeah. it's like, oh, we're, you know, we're pretty well taken care of right now. We've got a branding agency. We've got a marketing agency. We've got all these things. But if you come in and you're like, you focus on, what does he say in the article? If you, if you just focus on customer loyalty marketing, so increasing lifetime uh, customer value, like that's the thing that you focus on in this email. It's something that you specialize in. Then they might say something like, well, we've got someone that kind of handles that for us. Our, our ad agency handles our loyalty program. And you could say something like, well, a lot of generalist agencies or a lot of full service agencies dabble in customer loyalty marketing, but we specialize in it and re results are phenomenal. You know, is that something you, that you'd like to talk about? And they might say no, like, no, we don't really care yeah. about that. But strategically, if that's a big thing for them in the, the year, the coming year, that was a big, you know, some metric that they're going to be measured on at the end of this year, then they might be like, yeah, I'll, I'll talk to you for 15 minutes about that. The other thing that can happen is they say no now, but they save your email. Right. And that's what, that's what the specificity, the specialization does, is it creates that moment. And they're like, oh. I'm going to save this. I might need this later. Right. The, the other thing that the, I love, the pointiest point of the spear, the other thing that's really good for that is when you're asking somebody who is super busy, maybe even famous, to come on your podcast as a guest. And maybe they've just come out with a new book. And yeah, they're doing a whole bunch of podcast tours. But you pick one specific thing about the book. Like one, it might be one statement, it might be a chapter, it might be a paragraph, it might be an offhand comment they made in the introduction. Totally. Mm -hmm. And that does it every time. In fact, I just cracked a book today with somebody that I'd like to have as, as a guest. And um, they, in the introduction, they made a statement that I, I've never heard anybody in our space say before. Mm. And was like, oh, that's the thing. <laughs> that's cool. the thing. Yeah, it's and the yeah, hook, it's the angle. Yeah. Right? Exactly. And I'm, I, I doubt if anybody else is going to pick up on that. And right. that's when it gets exciting because the author feels seen when right. you do that. It's not like, oh, yes, let me just, let's just talk about the eight chapters of your book. What was chapter one? Yeah. Um, <laughs> versus a really, you know, an engaged conversation with somebody who actually read the book and has a particular interest in something that you're talking about. Yeah. And the cool thing, I think the cool thing for the, the author in, this, in that scenario and the audience is that if somebody's got a new book out, they're making the rounds and giving the same interview to everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so boring. So it's, I, I've just out of my own interest, when I'm really stalking someone, I want to get on the show, I'll listen to like three or four, maybe more interviews with them, YouTube, other podcasts. Hello, Seth Godin. Oh yeah, I mean. <laughs> I think you're the expert on his interviews at this right, point. Right, yeah. Yeah, so that's that's a little over the top. It's very over the top. But but you know, somebody like Annie Duke is coming on, and and I I lo I've read two of her books. I think they're great. It's really good stuff. And I had a it, it occurred to me like how funny would it be to see if we could get Annie Duke and Angela Duckworth on because Angela Duckworth wrote Grit, which is about not quitting, and Annie Duke wrote Quit, right. which is about quitting. And I was like, wouldn't that be funny? I said to myself. And then I came and then I was doing research, listening to a bunch of interviews. And she was like, I'm so sick of people who want to be an Angela Duckworth on the same show. <laughs> we agree. It wouldn't be a fight. It, you know, I was like, oh, I'm so glad I heard that. No cage match. No cage match. And she was much more polite about it than I just made her out to be. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, you really stand out when, you can pull up something that specific because it's like you did your homework. You're not just another one. You really differentiated yourself. It gets them excited. It gets you excited because it's like a new thing to talk about or a new angle to explore in more depth than they normally get a chance to. Yeah. So, so that's kind of like, it's the same thing. It really is the same thing. You're like the specificity in the outreach is really important. It really helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it and it needs to be genuine. In in the Blair thing, there it doesn't really matter because it's just like very specific. But in the podcast thing, it needs to be genuine. Like you don't want to say, "Oh, I love that you said this," when you really don't care about that. Yeah. It's not really your thing. You're you're kind of 
complimenting them to butter them up to get something that you want. And sometimes you can get away with that once, but you know, it, it's not something you can keep doing. It's not genuine. It doesn't help you to build a relationship or understand that other person better. It becomes too surfacy. Mm-hmm. So the specificity allows you to get under, under the hood and kind of engage with them in a different way. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, in this example, it's kind of like you're genuinely a fan. Like you've demonstrated that you're genuinely a fan, you know? Yeah. In the, I yeah. think in the, the sales outreach, like, Hey, let's see if you know, let's jump on a call and see if there's a good fit is more like you gen- genuinely have, um, speci- I don't want to keep using the word specific, but it's like, you have a very clear value proposition. It's super specific. So you, you're like, you've, Fan, what's the word for it was like you've identified an ideal customer like you think you have you're pretty sure you've mm-hmm. identified an ideal customer it's like hey you are you remind me of my favorite customer ever kind of thing this is really I, this is i'm much better at this when i'm typing <laughs> and also when when there's an actual example so like because we're on the receiving end of these all the time for guests i mean anybody with a podcast is getting all these like oh I'd, let yeah. me tell you about John Blonde, who's so great, and let me tell you all the great things about him. And uh, and they're they just obviously not a fan. They they don't listen to the show. And they'll, yeah, there's they'll, no like, connection. Oh. They always have this one sentence at the top that's like, "We love the recent episode with insert episode title where you talked about thing from the show notes." Anyway, <laughs> let me tell you about Joe Blow. Yeah, let me tell you about what I want you to do. Yeah, yeah. So when you're when you're hyper specific and you've really I mean, it does kind of come down to doing your homework, which is maybe a good segue into if this sounds hard, trust your instincts. It is hard. That's why it's not spam, (laughs) right? That, (laughs) That will be the thing that prevents you from being spammy because you have to do a fair amount of homework to identify that this could be an, this really looks like an ideal customer. You need to know what they look like, right? So like you need to do your research. Maybe it's sort of demographic information. Maybe it's information about the business, a particular size. Maybe it's, uh, I remember talking to someone who would um, do their research. I think it was Norm Lieberman on, on Ditching Hourly, where he would like read the annual reports and see what the CEO strategy for the year was. And then he'd just reach out to like the, the C-suite and like upper level executives and knowing what their marching orders are. Yeah. And it's like public information. <laughs> you know, it's like just yeah, do your I used homework. To do, I used to do that with big firms because you you I could know who runs the function that I'm calling on. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean I understand the business. And the good people who ran functions did understand their business very well. And the ones who didn't were not very interesting. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that was be, be the first thing that I would do. And even now, I mean, I don't take a call with anybody where I haven't looked at their website, gone to their social media, you know, get some kind of a sense of who they are. And if we're actually having a sales conversation, I'm going to download stuff and read it. Like I want to know before we talk how it looks from the outside, which is not the same as how it feels from the inside, sure. but it's a helpful perspective to have. Yeah. Yeah. So since it's some work to do, I mean, the, the benefits are potentially really big. So it can be worth doing, especially this time of year when people are probably looking to initiate new projects. Uh, but to keep it from, it, it like automatic, if you do it right, it automatically keeps it from being spammy because it's too much work. You can't, you can't just like fill out a spreadsheet with like, you know, first name, company name, personalized statement, and then do a <laughs> mail merge and something. And right. you can just smell those a mile away. You know, they're just, it's just too obvious. But when somebody is re- genuinely there to help, has a something that you value, and it's like boom, right there, straight to the point. It's tough not to reply, especially if they if if they ask you to reply yes or no, and not to worry, you know, just uh, yes or no is fine. I don't want to bother you if if you don't think it might be a good fit. Well, in sidebar, you can absolutely use these kinds of templated communi- templated communications in your business and still have them be highly personal and feel personal because they are, because you've done the work. And that's what I like about the things we're talking about. It's a template. 
And um, the magic email, I wouldn't change much. But the other ones, you know, you need to customize them for yourself and for the particular situation. But it's a template that you can use. And, and it, it, if you do that every time you're going to send one of these, you save it, you pull it up, you can, it will help you resist writing these long-winded things or not focusing on one thing per email or one call to action. That's a really good point, right? Like the the easy parts of the email should stay easy, right? The sort of connective yes. tissue, the mad libs of it should stay easy, but you still need to do the homework for it to work so that the blanks that you do fill in are, they connect, they work, they yes. click with the other person. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of templated communications for this kind of stuff. I really am, because why rethink it every single time? What what you're rethinking is, oh, who is this person? And for me, that's fun. Yeah. Like, who is this person? What do they do? What floats their boat? Can I help them? How how might I help them? So that's the fun part. I don't want to have to think about, oh, yeah, it's three paragraphs. And the first paragraph is this. I, you know, I'm just, I keep a whole bunch of templated communications, and I would pull it out. And then I would write it for this person. Yeah, Boom, exactly. Done. Yeah, I have loads in my text expander program. I have loads of these, these sorts of things. But it's an entire, entire category. I probably have 50 things in it just for email, like replies mm -hmm. and outreach and that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Cool. All right, we got anything else that we should add? Have we, uh, have we flogged this beast? I think so. I feel like, <laughs> Enough? I feel like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to email Blair and have him send in a, I am Blair Ends and approve this message. <laughs> little sound clip for the end. <laughs> well, I am finally meeting Blair in person in October. So Fun. I'm, yeah, I'm excited about that at the MYOB conference. Yeah, he wasn't there last year. He was jetting around. So I missed it. Yeah, he's doing a bunch of stuff. In fact, they're doing a live Two Bobs podcast episode while we're there. So it should be fun. Fun. Excellent. All right. Well, this has been a paid advertisement for Win Without Pinching. <laughs> 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 Full this no I'm kidding. Totally kidding. All right, folks. So that's it for this week. I'm Jonathan Stark. And I'm Rochelle Moulton. And we hope you join us again next time for the business of authority. Bye. Bye-bye.